Hi there, welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. In this podcast, I interview successful business leaders and industry experts to help you grow your business. In this episode, my guest is Christian Hardcourt. Christian is a keynote speaker, she's a leadership trainer, and she's also a career coach. And she's also a host of Inspirational Leadership Podcast as well. She's been helping business leaders to scale organization for the last 15 years. We had a very interesting discussion around business, leadership, and organization. Kristen talks about uh, you know, what kind of challenges and opportunities business leaders are dealing with. She also talks about decision-making process for business leaders, how they're making decisions around the hybrid environment, uh, in-office environment. And she also talks about how to work to your potential instead of working to your quota. So if you like this discussion, don't for us, uh, forget to send me your feedback and thumbs up. Until next time, please welcome my guest, Kristen Hardcourt. Hi guys, welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. Today, my guest is Kristen Hardcourt. Kristen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for your time today. Hi, Grammy. Great to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Okay, so you've been helping out business leaders, uh, you know, for, for many years. So if you just walk about here, so what do you see from your clientele or, or your thoughts? What are some of the biggest challenges leaders are up against and, and uh, you know, and how they're going about it to deal with those challenges? Yeah, that's a, it's a big question. I think that there's a lot on their plate. I think uh, sometimes people get into leadership and they don't know exactly what they signed up for when they get into leadership. And I think it can sometimes be very lonely as well if you don't have a lot of peers in a community to talk with around a lot of the challenges that show up. So I think the the, fir- the first thing that shows up for me, you know, we're now there, if we think about during the pandemic and now we're on the other side of the pandemic, um, no matter what, as a leader, there can be, you have a whole bunch of people that you're supporting and you're wanting to be there for them to coach and mentor. And it's really important for leaders and where I see them not always doing this is holding boundaries and they're giving a lot to others, but not necessarily taking as good care of themselves as they could be. Um, That's something that I saw a lot in the pandemic, like leaders that I'm really happy with the way they were showing up in terms of lots of empathy and compassion, but that takes a lot out of you. And so what are they doing to make sure that they're charging their battery. I think that leaders are working in these environments that are constantly changing. Like we live in this VUCA environment where it's like, you don't know what the next week, the next month is going to look like things are shifting so quickly, whether it be recessions, whether it be environmental, whether it be technology. I mean, it feels like every week I'm learning something else new about AI and with your technology background, Mm -hmm. you would know a lot more about this than I do. But navigating um, constant change and change happening at such a rapid pace that it's not only the leader that's having to deal with all this constant change, but supporting the people around them that are dealing with all of this constant change and being able to create an environment that both supports them, but at the same time helps to usher them into this changing landscape and making sure that they can engage, be, be able to do that. I think another thing when we think about leaders is um, as a leader, you are supporting lots of different personality types. There's no one size fits all. So you might feel like, okay, I figured it out with this person, but now all of a sudden the next person doesn't not the same thing. So you're constantly having to pivot to uh, be flexible, to be asking a lot of questions around what that person needs, how to best support them. And I think going back to what I said at the very beginning, that can be lonely. And so I, I think it's really important that leaders have some sort of support, whether that be peers, um, one-on-one conversations, whether that be training, coaching that's being given within the organization or from outside in order to be able to set them up for success because there's a multitude of things that they are dealing with on a daily basis. Wow. Wow. There's so many good points you mentioned, uh, uh, Christian, on this. Um, so, you know, um, back to what, what you just mentioned, that there's so many constant changes in the, in the industry, whether it's economical or technology changes, you know, you know the, the, as a leader, not only you need to be aware of it, but you need to be on top of things, right? So, because you have to make a decision out of that new information, new changes are coming um, in industry, right? And you have, and the decision you're making that impact the business, that impact your people, that impact the companies that you run. So, you know, you need to not only be aware of, but you need to be on top of these these new changes so you can make a good decision for your company. 
but it does uh, it take a toll on you personally, um, you know, as, as, a, as a leader that, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself, how are you going to take care of people at the end of the day, right? So so what do you see the business leaders are doing for last, you know, for years, you know, was was a little bit slow down in the businesses, gave them more time to, you know, to do some of that stuff to take care of themselves or, or they find a different ways of taking care of themselves? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there is they're recognizing why well-being needs to be front and center. And that has to be something that's prioritized. And so I talk to a lot of leaders. And for some of this, this can be all new to them. For others, it might be something that they've had at certain stages in their journey and at other times of their journey, depending on what's going on with their families, stage of life it sometimes can go on the back burner. So it's around making sure that they're re-implementing those foundational things when it comes to well-being. Things as simple as making sure they're getting sleep, that they're getting exercise, eating healthy, um, having time with family and friends, doing things that fill them up, that, that make them really happy is a really important part of what's happening here. Um, but I think the other thing when it starts to be around being well, being able to make these decisions that are constantly happening. And, and as you um, beautifully pointed out, having to sometimes be very decisive in their decisions. I think there's uh, learning how to self-trust and listening to themselves when they make decisions and also recognizing it's not a hundred percent. There's going to be times where they make the decision. They make the decision based on the facts in front of them and what feels like the best decision. But later on, other information becomes available that maybe they didn't have at the same at the time they made that decision. And so sometimes if we want to use the word failure or things don't work out okay, that's all right, right? Like you yeah. make the decision, doesn't turn out the, the way you thought. Okay. So how are we going to course correct? How are we going to pivot from here? What's the next iteration going to be? So I think sometimes what I'm talking a lot about with leaders is helping them have the confidence to make a decision, knowing it's not going to be a hundred percent. They're making the best decision with the information they have at this time and take away some of that perfectionism and that pressure on themselves that they have to do it perfectly and have it all right. Yeah, replying to all the changes happening in a business is the one thing, you know, you have a little bit of control over it, you know, or, or you can anticipate what's coming down a pipe. But other side of that is people's help, uh, people around you, your, your staff, your, your, your suppliers, you know, people's health is changing so constantly, your people are changing so constantly, that's also an impact which you have no control over it. And you have to make some decisions and you have to help out a lot of people, there's a lot of responsibility on you. And, and that you can't control. And and I think your point is well taken, what you just mentioned, or was a great point that, you know, there's so much control you're going to have when it comes to people's help. You know, how are you going to go out and help those? And, and you still expect to go out and help no matter what, what the people are going through, because you're supposed to help them. So, yeah. So where, where are some of the challenges in an area? People work in a hybrid environment. They could be home. They could be in office, but they, they need a lot of help uh, these days. You know, uh, what are they going through? Yeah, I think that it's a really important point that you're talking about there when we look at the remote work. Um, this is something where I continue to educate organizations where they want to go back to how things were previously. That doesn't exist anymore. It's dead. The version before COVID and the version afterwards, we don't go back to the version beforehand. It doesn't exist. It's a new version. Yeah. And so I get it. It's changed again, but it's just recognizing that we have to work with the the, the environment and the decisions and what ended up happening, you know, so many organizations that said previously, we can't do remote work. We're not structured for that. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, guess what? Not only are we doing wor remote work, people are actually thriving and doing really well and actually like it better working from home. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be conscious of though, that's not the case for everyone. Some people actually couldn't wait to get back into the office because you know, things that they were experiencing at home, there can be challenging environments or they live alone and it felt very gotcha. lonely. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's a one size fits all, but it's created uh, an opportunity and this opportunity always exists. But I think some organizations are getting better at listening, at asking questions, at not making assumptions, right? So when they start to hear their assumption might be everybody wants to go back to work, not true. Their assumption might be that people want to go back four times a, a week, but they really want two times, right? So having dialogue and asking and figuring out um, what people really want and what's important 
The other thing that I think is really important, Gurmeet, is as a leader, you have an opportunity, and I would actually say a responsibility to advocate, to advocate for yourself and to advocate for your people. And when decisions are being made and you're seeing, you know, my whole team is struggling with this, especially if you're a C-suite leader, that's where you're having the daring conversation and saying, I think we need to reevaluate this. I don't think this is serving the people. I don't think this is serving the organization. Mm -hmm. I think another thing I wanted to circle back with, with what you'd asked before as well, which comes, goes back to the advocating piece and well-being. I see organizations where people are getting burnt out because there is too much on their plate. It is not sustainable. As a leader, you're both advocating for yourself and you're advocating for your people to get resources. If you see people burnt out and they can't, they can't handle what's on their workload, they're going to leave the organization anyways, whether that's going to be through mental health and STD or long-term disability, or they're going to go to another organization because they're going to say, I can't do this anymore. So I think as an, as a leader, there's a lot of advocating, um, and, and again, asking lots of questions and coming from a place of curiosity. Yeah, because lines are blurry, right? Because um, we keep stacking the work on top of the work, and but and people lines are blurry. When is a personal time and when is a when a business time, right? So for because when you're working in a home, we're expecting people to work whatever hour they want to do, but they can work, um, you know, they can they can work in the hours they want, but they have to get the work done, right? So so people, where do they have to make a sacrifice? They're making a sacrifice on a personal time, or they're making a sacrifice on on a break times, right? So they're constantly working. So definitely that 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 uh, results in a burnout because lines are blurry, which is personal, what's a business anymore, right? Exactly. And I think what I see uh, often is leaders who might even say, I'm, I'm for work-life integration. I don't expect people to be emailing me or texting me all night. Yet that leader goes on vacation and they're checking in when they're on vacation. That leader is texting at eight o'clock at night. That leader is sending emails at 7 a.m. in the morning. And they will say, well, I don't have those expectations for my people. It, you're saying one thing and your actions are saying you're doing another. something else. Yeah, you, you can't like you're modeling that and you're sending very mixed messages because now they think, well, I don't actually believe that they believe in the whole work life integration because I think that if I don't do what they're doing, that I somehow might, you know, I might be out of a job one day or I'm not doing, I'm not doing the expectations for the role. So it's really, really critical that that leader's actions and behaviors are in alignment with what they're saying. Very interesting. So the skill set as the leaders we we had before COVID, uh, Chris, to manage teams it was a little bit different skill set. The skill set you we we outlined currently is a little bit different skill set, right? So, what are we gonna do as the leaders? You know, definitely we have to prepare. One is we have to learn this new skill set. Whether we have to manage people through uh, technology or or it's different way of looking at health was not as critical before COVID for for leaders to to take care of for people. So a lot of items change. Definitely perspective change. People have expectation change. So skill set has to be. De- you know, develop new to to manage people or or help people out. Yeah. What do we have to do to? What is the leaders doing to, to pay, pick on this new skill set? And also, how are we going to translate that skill set into teams? Because we can develop more leaders in the teams as well. Yeah, I think those are really great questions as well. I think um, first of all, it's recognizing that how you're supporting and um, and checking in with your team has to be very intentional. When you're in the office, there's more of a possibility, even if you don't have a meeting where you might run into each other and just kind of have that casual banter that's not just about business outcomes. It's also about human interaction and relationship building. So yeah. that needs to be intentionally built in. Um, so I really encourage leaders to be having consistent one-on-one uh, one-on-one check-ins with their team. And in those one-on-one check-ins, it's not just about, you know, what they're working on from a business outcome perspective. It's also around, Hey, how are you doing? What do you need more of for me? What's going well? What's not going well? How might I be able to support that? Uh, So again, not making assumptions because they're not seeing people. If we start to think even about, uh, connecting online in virtual meetings, you know, that one's really interesting because, So sometimes we have meetings where everybody has their cameras turned off and I feel mixed emotions about that one because I get it because sometimes people are turning their cameras off because 
they are exhausted with Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. Yeah. And so you can understand that why they might be turning the camera off. But at the same time, you're not getting that same opportunity to engage and be able to see face to face. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say there's any hard and fast rule where I would say everybody needs to have their camera on for every meeting. That's that's I'm not going to say that. But are we suggesting and encouraging that so that there can be more interaction? When you have the team getting together, are you doing something to personalize your team meetings as well, where there's maybe something fun that's happening at the beginning, or people are talking about what they're grateful for, or they're talking about something where people are still getting that personal element that tends to happen in face-to-face -face meetings that might not be happening the same on online. Mm -hmm. um, so I think being really, really intentional about that. You know, what I would say, Gurmeet, is a lot of these skills have been critical skills for leadership, whether it's face-to-face -face or whether it's online, it just creates, it's amped up. It creates even more pressure around needing to be able to, what I would call those emotional intelligence skills to be used in mm -hmm. your day-to-day -day leadership. It's, um, if the, if the emotional intelligence skills are not being used, which I would talk, talk about those as being the human skills, those communication skills you're not going to have this high performing teams. You're not going to engage and be able to achieve the same business outcomes. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, there's a huge return on investment for all leaders to understand themselves better. And the beauty is that this isn't a skill that you either have it or you don't, you can learn it. You can yeah. learn it. You can, you can develop these skills. And as you start to show up with that higher level of emotional intelligence, you connect better one-on-one -on -one and with your team members, which then starts to have much better conversations, which then lead to better outcomes and ultimately the strategy, right? Because now you're hearing one another, you're connecting better, and you're being able to have that higher performance that leads to those outcomes and the strategic direction that your company is trying to go towards. Yeah, those those emotional intelligence skills. Uh, I think uh, for the last few years, it, they just got a lot more important um, than than they were before. You know, they were always important, but I think importance is is, is they become a lot more critical. You know, we we manage teams, people sitting at home if they work in a hybrid environment. We don't know what's going on. You know, there could be something going on in the personal life. It could be you know financially going on or something in a family member. You know, um, look at how many mental health issues are going on out there. So somebody in the family, maybe you know, I was looking at numbers and they said one um, out of every um, you know five uh, people either they they're dealing with the mental health challenges or they had know somebody who's dealing with it in a family. So if the numbers are so high, so somebody's dealing with those challenges, right? And when you see on a camera, you don't get to see that because what people are dealing with. So having those emotional uh, intelligence skills, learning and, and uh, understanding people definitely put you in a different bargain and you can understand people. If you can understand, you can probably help them a little better, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's that that empathy and the relationship building. I think sometimes people don't recognize some other elements of emotional intelligence, which another big piece of emotional intelligence is assertiveness. And assertiveness is an incredibly important quality as a leader as well, because we talk sometimes about the empathy and compassion and making sure that we're there for our people. And yet, you're running a business and within a business as well, there needs to be very clear expectations. Sometimes that means having difficult conversations. Sometimes that means giving constructive feedback. And that's an area I actually see a lot of leaders struggle in as well. They're inconsistent or they're, um, so I, or I can see one extreme where they're being aggressive and that's not assertiveness. So they're delivering feedback not in the right way of delivering feedback that's not going to be received well and not going to be applied. So I think that's a really important element of leadership is yes, we want the compassion and empathy, but we also need to have the assertiveness and make sure that there's accountability for people. People actually want it as well, to be quite honest, like they want to be able to learn and grow and have somebody that is um, helping them to, you know, see their mistakes and see where they're not doing things as well and be able to improve if it's delivered well. Um, the other thing I like to talk about when it comes to emotional intelligence, Gurmeet, is um, the stress piece for sure. We've taught, we've, we've, we touched on that with the well being. But the other thing that's really important with emotional intelligence that people don't always think of is 
as you get better at working through your emotional intelligence, you become a much better problem solver because people will sometimes say, oh, I'm not emotional in my decisions. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, right. Like, (laughs) oh, I leave the emotions outside of it. No, the amount of reactivity that I see in workplaces where people are not seeing reality as it is, where they are having impulse control issues, which is blowing up, saying things in a way that's not communicating very effectively, that derails so many teams and so many meetings. And that's a huge part is like learning to how to be able to self-regulate when you get triggered and when big emotions come up, which a lot of people never, no one pulled them aside in school and said, Hey, this is what you do when you have big emotions and you're having a biological response and your nervous system is out of control. It's a big, big skill to learn and has a huge impact, but it requires it, it. You need someone to help you be able to learn that skill. I see that very often. That is that is a very great point you just mentioned, Kristen. I know C-level employees, presidents, CEOs, you know, the companies. I see the moment they have to make a decision, how the emotions worry, right? Um, it's a, it's a, everything is very calm, but the, the, the point comes when you have to make a decision. I see the emotions all over the place, right? So I seen very rare good, you know, CEOs, you know, they can control all the emotions. You know, I think they, everybody needs a help in this area. You know, definitely need, we need to, we all need to get better at it. Um, very savvy CEOs, I president of the company, they're seeing that with emotions get so high when they have to make a decision. It's not only because it's a right or wrong decision. It's also other part of that is what my team's going to think of this decision, what, what these people are going to think of that decision. Right. So I think that part, that area is a much bigger than that, than if it's a wrong or right decision or not. They know it's a wrong or right decision. They already know that. So even the making right decision is what, how it's going to impact my team, what they're going to think of it, what other leaders going to think of it, how I'm going to look. That's more important than, than simple decision. You got it. You got it. Right. And this is all, and this is where it's, um, people can be so logical, especially CEOs. Like they're, they're very smart. There's a reason where they, why they've gotten yeah. to where they have gotten. And so they almost don't even recognize, they think to themselves, Oh no, I'm always logical in my decisions. No, no, you're not like <laughs> there are emotions operating in the background and emotions are not bad. Like I'm not here to label that they shouldn't be feeling emotions. They're a human being. I want them to be feeling emotions but it's around how are you working through when those emotions are are showing up? And um, are you conscious of those times where it's like, you know what, maybe I need to pause for a second and regroup before I start to take next steps or before I start to communicate this message to my team, because noticing that they're triggered and then trying to communicate, they're not going to communicate as effectively. Like they don't have access to their creative thinking and their most resourceful self. Yeah, they, they, you know, they're very logical to the come to the point where, as you as you mentioned, um, but before make a decision, I need to talk to this person. I need to talk to this person. I need to talk to, and, you know, when you ask further, is it is it you need to talk to people? Is it to get information or is it to seek approval or is it what is the purpose behind it that you need to talk to people? When you ask those questions, they, they, you get totally different different uh, uh, you know information. And when you dig deeper, all it is that that emotions are high i don't want to make a decision let me talk to somebody yeah. um so i seen that very very you know first hand you know um, um you know the many decision you know uh, people when you make trying to make a decision somehow that the emotions get but i think that's what as as a leaders that's what we train to keep emotions down and make a very clear decision instead of uh, getting emotional i think it's a work ongoing basis we have to work on ourselves whether you know working with somebody like you with, with you somebody like you or somebody else we just need to keep working on it and get better at this area Exactly. Because, you know, one of the things that I notice, um, so many leaders operate from the head up, right? So they're very in their head, very logical. Their body is really good at getting their attention to say, something's feeling off here. I'm not feeling as supported as I need to. And so they start to also learn, like, what does it look like to support themselves through big emotions? Sometimes that looks like going and processing and releasing that emotion in a healthy way not by yelling at an employee, not by getting frustrated with their spouse at home because of what happened at work, but around, okay, I'm noticing that emotions are showing up right now. I need to figure out how to support myself through this. And I, it's, it's such an amazing skill once you do it, but so many people have learned to repress 
and suppress emotions and that's not serving them either. Right. So I also want to be conscious of, we don't want to get to a point where you're unemotional. We want to get a point that you're using your emotions in a healthy way. I see. So, so making a right decision with emotion, it's just not eliminating emotion, but using emotion to make a right decision for the company. Yes. Yeah. Cause emotions, like sometimes those leaders, their self-trust, like they might be saying something's off. And so that's why they're going to all of the different people to get the approval or to get their buy-in because they want to have someone supporting that it's the right decision. What maybe what they need is just an hour by themselves to have some self-reflection or go for a walk and hear their truth instead of going to other people, right? But that requires some self-trust. Mm-hmm. A lot of business leaders, you know, as you know, they, 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 you know, they build the companies, they come from technical background or they come from some sort of trade that they were very good at. And then they, they you know, end up in a leadership position where now it's not a, the expertise, not a technical is expertise, more of a people. Um, when you come from that kind of technical background, whether, whether you are engineer in a background or you are a lawyer and you know running a business, you bring that kind of same you know same uh, um, kind of you know uh, experience and and the same kind of processing when you're trying to make a decision, right? So you need to and all those things not a very emotional, you know, engineering, um, you know, uh, lawyering. Those are logical logical trade. And and when you're making a business decision that's going to impact your company, that's a totally different kind of decision you make it, right? So, so you gotta find the right information to go about it. Yeah. And I love, thank you for bringing that up because I do work with a lot of technical experts that move into leadership. So they have that very high technical aptitude. And then because they're doing so well in their roles, they get promoted within the organization. I can't tell you how many leaders will tell me, I didn't realize there's going to be all this human stuff. Like when I moved up, I'm having to like manage people all day long. I just want to get my job done. And it's, it's true. Like there's management and you're managing people to be able to achieve what you need to achieve, but then you're also having to deal with these dynamics. And while you might be thinking, this is a very logical decision. We know that people don't always think logically, they think with emotion. So you're still having to find ways to be able to get buy-in, to get people, um, to help influence people. And how do you do that? Well, you make them seen, heard, feel valued, like they're part of, that can be very difficult for technical thinkers because they're not, they're like, uh, I, I just want to tell them this is what it is and this is what we're doing. Uh, why do I have to? Well, it's recognizing, oh, like your role now is to be doing a lot of coaching and mentoring and influencing and persuading and helping people get on board with ideas and yeah. helping them feel like they're part of, as opposed to you're just telling them this is how it's going to be. People people like autonomy and they pe- want to feel like they're part of the process. Um, that can be a big learning curve for people going from you know, they have the technical expertise, but again, going back to my other example, no one pulled them aside and said, Hey, you're managing people now. And so there's going to be mentoring and there's going to be coaching. There's going to be asking questions. There's going to be showing up from a place of curiosity. There's going to be deep listening. You don't, you, and guess what? Technical people who are so good at fixing things, sometimes your role is not going to be to fix it. You don't get to fix it. You have to help them get to the answers that can be very frustrating because you're really good at getting to solutions. But the role sometimes is I'm going to ask a lot of questions for that individual to learn on their own. So they feel empowered to be able to make decisions without me coming in with all the answers and fixing it. That can be incredibly uncomfortable in a new skill set. Yeah, that, that, what, that's what I, you know, um, I had to learn that, you know, many years ago as well. You know, I, this this is uh, where where you focus more on a questions um, than than a solutions, right? So um, you could come to come up with the solutions. And technical people, including myself, we are uh, we are a couple step ahead of when you, when we talking yeah. to somebody. Um, yeah. Somebody tells us problem, we already know what the solution is in our mind. Yeah, and uh, and we don't want to listen to the problem. We we kind of start spitting our solutions. Hey, this is how you need. Yeah. What you need to fix it. But you know, as as a leader, you can't do that. I think uh, one thing you have to learn as a leader is not given a solution. You simply just want to ask the right questions so people can discover the solution by themselves instead of you helping them with the solution. And and that that skill set takes a lot of listening and, uh, you know, taking a step back and focus on the questions more than a solution itself. And I think that that it took me a few years, but I think that's that is that's where need to time needs to be spent. And it requires patience. 
right? Like that's patience, right? Because you're sitting there thinking, I already know what you need. I already know what it's probably going to be, but I have to let you go on, go through your process to get there so that you feel connected to it. I, 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 that example is making me think of, I've had lots of leaders as well, where they have to slow down because they just know how to get to A to Z so quickly, but nobody else had a chance to come along with them because they're already to Z. The other people are like five steps behind. You have to usher them in and help bring them on the journey. And then also sometimes they haven't been a lot of meetings to understand where you've already gotten to. So you have to help them bring them along to all of those several steps that happen outside of conversations that they might've been part of. Well, if I'm coming to this, uh, getting to the solution by myself, I may be able to do it faster one time, but if I can get other people to discover the solution, now I just train somebody who, uh, if it's the right person, I don't have to worry about that person's going to come up with a solution every time there, there's, there's a problem, right? So um, that way, you know, you definitely, you know, it's, it's a little bit slow process early on, but in, on long terms, you got somebody who, who can make a decision uh, instead of beside you getting involved in a decision. Exactly. Because I say a lot of times leaders can feel very stretched and be being pulled in a lot of directions. So it feels counterintuitive to spend that little bit of extra time because they feel like I don't have the time. But actually, by being proactive like this, they are saving so much time down the road. Got you. Um, we we are in a, you know an interior that you know it's technology sector is getting bigger and bigger. We are we are you know uh, in a Toronto we are getting more tech savvy. You know and a lot of uh, you know big technology uh, firms investments here. A lot of uh, auto is invest. A lot of young force um, you know coming to the workforce. A lot of kids graduated from the schools. They're they're looking at company totally different ways. You know definitely we I hire a lot of young young staff as well. Everybody's I think hiring in a technology sector. A lot of young people from a university and colleges coming out. Do they expect something else? You know um, their expectation from leaders are a little bit different than what we had like a few, couple of generations ago, right? So what are some of the generation? What are you th- what are your thoughts are? What are they expecting out of that? You know they're looking looks like the the reason why the company exists. They want more of it than than less than before. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I I always like to describe with generations, all generations have wonderful things that come along with it. And then there's some, some difficulties or challenges that come along with it. So Mm -hmm. what I've noticed in terms of the next generation, some awesome things that they're doing is they are advocating for what they want in terms of flexible workplaces, in terms of they want to feel purpose and meaning in their work. They want to understand how they connect to the bigger vision. So they're going to ask more questions about that. Um, They really, really like personal development, learning and growth, and they want the organization to support that. They are more likely to recognize when their mental health is not being honored and they will like have boundaries and they will take action and say, you know, I I need to take some time off or they might even try to advocate for having um, sabbaticals. And um, they're what I see more of, which I love is they're not um, working. They're not living to work. They're working to live which is a beautiful philosophy. I mean, I love it. I think that all generations actually at our core want to have that, right? Like they want it. We want to be able to enjoy all parts of our lives. Mm -hmm. So I think some really good things are happening there. And I think, um, and then, you know, even some of the things with organizations where in the recruitment process where they're, well, you've only, I see you jumping around and going to a lot of different companies and yeah, because that's what it looks like now. Like that, the, there's not the same expectations that they're going to be in the same job for five years or ten years or whatever that looks like. And spending so much time focusing on that, I don't think it's a good use of anybody's time. I think it's for sure you're always wanting to understand, you know, when they are at one company and they leave, you know, why did they leave? What weren't they getting there? And sometimes I might just say, you know, I wanted to change a pace. I wanted to learn and grow. And going to different companies are giving me never, different opportunities to learn and grow. I think one of the things to be aware of with this generation is, and this isn't their fault. I think it's what they, a lot of them experience with their parents and how they were raised and that we've got some helicopter parenting that was happening and they can sometimes be impatient and want things to have happened yesterday. And I think that's something that, and I, I let people know as well, that generation, letting them know there's something to be said about earning the right to get there and getting the experience, right? Like you can't, you can't just snap your finger and make experience happen. Like you learn things through experience. So I think 
the more you can help also help them understand why um, from a career pathing perspective, um, yeah. it might be uh, valuable to them to spend a little bit more time learning something before rushing to the next thing and wanting to move their way up the ladder. I have noticed, and this is what I've heard from a lot of organizations, there can sometimes be this impatience and this feeling like of entitlement, like it should have happened yesterday. And that's a gap that I would, I, I would be cognizant of both the organization to be able to help them understand that. And if anyone's listening, that's from Gen Z or part of that, it's an invitation. It's an invitation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. Hey, there's so much to uh, for, draw from your wisdom, your experience is. Um, let's talk about your journey, Kristen. How did you get interested in leadership and, and how do you, uh, you know, how do you get to the point where you want to help out other people? Yeah. So I would say the reason why I've got so interested in leadership development and doing this work and really trying to create more positive cultures is unfortunately because my first couple of leaders were not very good leaders. They were pretty toxic leaders. Those, uh, you know, right out of university, I get into the workforce and to now looking back, I think they just didn't have the training and development and they just didn't know how to do it. So there was a lot of micromanaging. There was a lot of taking credit. There was lack of personal uh, growth, development, accountability, all of that kind of stuff. And for the first little while, I just thought, oh, I, I guess this is what corporate is. Like, I didn't know, but I, I'm just going to have to deal with it. This is what I signed up for. And then I was very lucky after that to have two or three amazing, amazing leaders. And so I started to realize, like, look at this contrast and totally how yeah. much like the impact, like I was just so motivated, so engaged. I just, I worked so hard. No one even had to ask me to work hard because I was so loyal and excited and energized because I had great leadership and um, people who really respected me and, and, and created an, an environment where values were being honored. And so I started to really feel passion about number one, helping organizations understand that they also have a responsibility to help set their leaders up for success. And you can't expect someone to go from an individual contributor to leader and all of a sudden be brilliant. Some people do. They're just very natural at it. It comes, it's just in their bones, but a lot of people that's not the case. And so yeah. I really wanted to set people up for success. And then, um, so that's why I do a lot of the leadership training and keynoting on that. And then from a coaching perspective, I just really enjoyed going on a journey with a leader and recognizing you can't meet with someone for a couple of se sessions. And then all of a sudden their life is completely transformed. Yeah. If behavior change was like that, I talk about this all the time. We, the internet <laughs> gives us all the information. We know what to do to be successful. So why are we not all doing it? Yeah. Because behavior change is super uncomfortable and it's hard, right? It's like, it's hard work. It's hard work. And so I think um, what I love so much about coaching is when you have somebody championing you there by your side, creating a sounding board where there's safety. And, and, and as a coach, I'm like, there's nothing wrong with you. It's, 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 you're just, you're learning something and two steps forward, one step back and have somebody continuing to support that and recognizing like it's, it's practice. And sometimes it's going to work really well. And sometimes it's not. And I just think most leaders don't wake up first thing in the morning saying, I want to be a jerk all day at work today. Like that's my goal. I want to make everybody angry, not be productive. And that's not their goal. And so I think the more, um, I just felt really, really passionate. So I started my own business six and a half years ago. And then for 15 years, I was very much working in the kind of end-to-end -end talent management, HR, leadership development space. Uh, and I just wanted to be able to, as an entrepreneur, you get to decide exactly what you're doing, what you're creating, the type, type of companies you want to work with. Very interesting. You know, as a, as a you know, uh, business leaders, we all running a business. There's so many blind spots and we don't get to see those blind spots. Uh, and that's where we need somebody like you to, you know, first of all, what skill we need to build, what do we need to get to and, 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 and how about somebody discovering those blind spots and letting you know, Hey, you're not over, you're overlooking this area that which is very important for business. Right. Um, so those are the areas, you know, our business leader need help. Um, definitely. You know, I learned so much from our discussion, uh, I, you know, people are watching or listening. I'll definitely uh, 
I recommend that they reach out to you for conversation. You know, uh, we always need a help as a business leader. There's so many blind spots that somebody needs to help us out to to get. You know, we can make our own mistakes and and uh, and get somewhere in a, in a long period of time, or somebody like you can help us to get there much faster because you can discover all the blind spots that we 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 are, we are dealing with. Yeah, thank you, Grimi. And I'd say the other thing I would add to that is. I also love reflecting people's brilliance back to them because I think people have all of these wonderful strengths and things that are in their zone of genius and their gifts and talents. And they sometimes don't recognize that about themselves. Yeah. Well, you're going through a one, one item after another one, right? So you don't have a time to do that. Something, sometimes it makes sense to just reflect it back. Well, um, where can people find you? How can they connect with you or Kristen? Yeah. So you can connect with me on my website is kristenharcourt.com. You'll see a lot of resources. I have a podcast called inspirational leadership. So there's lots of episodes that I've had over the last three and a half years where I talk a lot about these topics. And then I'm very active on social media. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, don't spend quite as much time on Facebook, but definitely a lot on Instagram and, uh, and LinkedIn. I'm going to include a link to uh, your podcast and uh, to, to your website. There's a lot of resources on your website below this video as well. Great, great episodes on your podcast. You know, um, you know, I, I've gone through a couple of discussion. Very, very great discussions. A lot of, lot of information there as well. Definitely recommend to check out your podcast as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate hey, it. Fun technology time. Thank you so much for your time. I learned a lot and enjoy our discussion. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation too.